good morning to you. And I was having coffee with a guy earlier this week, and I want to remind you of something that just bombarded my life, this overwhelming sense of God's presence in this church. Having coffee with this guy reminded me that God, his transformative power permeates this church. Seems like there's not a single week that goes by that I don't hear some story of redemption. Someone far from God brought near a broken life, been made whole. God's presence is here. And I tell you, my wife and I were so thankful our family beyond blessed to be a part of God's involvement throughout Northeast Christian Church. So, so glad to be here. So glad to be here. When they asked me to speak in this series, a couple of texts popped into my mind. And after a little prayer, I knew immediately which text I should teach. It comes from a passage in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel. And it's a scenario in David's life that is applicable to you and I to anyone, anytime, anywhere. 2 Samuel chapter 12, and why it's so pertinent to us, it recalls how every one of us has an I am here reality. David is mourning the death of his son. To compound the chaos, he is the one responsible for the set of circumstances that are resulting in his child's passing. David has pushed his wife Bathsheba away. He's committed some other sins that are just disrupting his life, we'll talk about in a moment. And he reaches this point where he realizes he can do nothing but define his I am here reality. When you lock eyes with life, it can be grueling a grueling task to be honest and open and say, this is where I am. But it's something that has to be done. Several years ago, Michelle and I, we locked eyes with life and it was difficult. I spent a month in the hospital, an entire month of April, just laid in a bed. I had a pulmonary embolism, a collapsed lung, and an infection that could not, couldn't be identified. My life was literally just hanging in the air. I could go at any moment. During that time, Michelle was alone with our a herd of kids, and she was navigating a series of an unfortunate events that we had to go through. I had to step away from my employment. We had to move, relocate from our home. She had to tend to the day-to-day -day grind and think, what does the future look like? I had Michelle retell me what she felt during this time, and she wrote this in her journal, and I'll read it to you. <clears throat> she said, I felt like I was alone. I received messages from family and friends, friends through cards and social media saying, everything is going to be okay, Michelle. God has got this. But David was in the hospital, and the doctors didn't know what was wrong. Driving home from the hospital one morning, I received a call from one of our closest friends, David's mentor, and he was the first person to say, hey, Michelle, you know David may not make it. But either way, God is sovereign and God is in control. This was bouncing around in my heart, but John was the first person to say this out loud. Nothing changed immediately, but for the first time, I felt comforted. When she told me that line, when I read that, I asked her to explain what comforted meant. And she said, when John said, you may die, David, I felt relief. I felt honest, I felt real. It was the first time in the scenario that Michelle had defined her I am here reality. And that's what David does. His child is dead. And here's what we read in the text. It's chapter 12, verses 22 and 23. David answered his attendants. While the child was alive, I fasted. I wept, I thought, who knows? The Lord may be gracious and let the child live. But now, but now that the child is dead, why should I go on fasting? Can I bring him back? I will go to him, but he will not return to me. Do you see that transition where David defines reality? 
There was a time when I thought, who knows, this is wide open. God may restore the child's life. But now, now he's dead. And he's left with one option, David is, to move forward or not. When we define our I am here reality, some of us, we look at life, we lock eyes with life, and it is so grueling that we just circle around. There's movement, there's motion, but there's no traction. Just spinning, just spinning. What's really interesting about this story is that just shortly prior to this text, God comes to David and he says, hey, the child's gonna die. He sends his word through the prophet Nathan. The child's gonna die. David glances at that reality and quickly turns away, succumbing to the pressure of his own pain. He turns away from God's word, reality, and he resorts to, I thought, who knows? Who knows? Check-in question. Anyone spinning? There's some movement in your life, but it's just going around reality. You've yet to define, I am here. Some people, they don't have this circular motion. They have inverted motion, regression, if you will. Reality is clear, and they run from it. Uh, studies have shown that we can actually learn helplessness in other areas when we're experiencing it in one area. In other words, you're weak, you're worn, unwise choices spills over into other areas of your life. What was once a financial problem is now a marital issue. There's regression. We see this in David's life. Chapter 12. If I get emotional, sorry. It's just a really pertinent text for us. Chapter 11, we see this in David's life. <clears throat> he compounds the chaos. You know chapter 11 well. He starts out this adulterous affair with Bathsheba by slacking on his job. He's just hanging back. As the commander-in-chief, the leader of the army, he takes a couple of days off and sends the army out. And then he spots Bathsheba. He allows lust to dictate his desires and then his tactic for turning his life around is deception and then he arranges for the murder of an innocent man compounding the chaos simply because he didn't define his I am here reality check in are you moving backward inverted motion even regression in your life reality you've locked eyes with it and now you're moving in this direction but some people that's a arrow if you can't see it they generate forward motion they generate forward motion and that's what our friend David is able to do even though his child is dead he embraces that I thought who knows but now that the child is dead my only option is to move forward we read this in chapter 12 verse 20 the child's dead so David gets up gets up from the ground he washes puts on lotions changed his clothes and he went into the house of the Lord and he worshiped then he went to his own house and at a request of his servants, they served him food and he ate. Now some of that may seem a bit odd to us, but to an ancient Hebrew, this ritual was indicative of someone who was intentionally moving out of a state of mourning. In other words, David says, this is my I am here reality. And I'm going to get up and intentionally move forward. Small caveat here. When you lock eyes with life, when you define your reality, when you open up that can of worms, some stuff will surface. Some of this surface, some of this stuff may be your own doing. 
and maybe it's the doing of someone else, but regardless, you are responsible. You may not be responsible for what happens to you, but you are responsible for what you do with what happens to you. So here we've got David defining reality and moving forward. So you say, how do you do that though? How's, how do you transition from who knows into but now, but now? What David does is he creates a boundary. Now a boundary is simply intentional space. A boundary is intentional space to create direction. So you remember David's words, I thought, who knows, maybe God will be gracious, he'll let the child live, the child dies. David says, but now, why should I fast? Why should I mourn? Why should I pray? I can't bring the child back, but I will one day go to him. Notice the language of that. A boundary defines what you can and cannot do. So David says, I can't bring the child back. That's the reality. I can't do anything to bring the child back. But I will one day go to him. And in the meantime, I'm going to make some stuff right. I'm going to set some boundaries. Without a boundary, without boundaries in your life and my life, without these boundaries, there's going to be procrastination, there's going to be depression, maybe even codependency. There's going to be shirking responsibilities or becoming over-responsible for someone else. You must create boundaries that say, this is who I am. This is when I say yes. This is when I say no. This is where I end, you begin, and vice versa. If you will, a boundary says, what is the return on this investment that I'm about to make. So David says, you know, I locked eyes with life and it was tough stuff. Tough. But I decided to move forward. I can't. But I can do this. From who knows into but now. So here's the problem with this though. This sounds good. But you're going to have people in your life, hopefully not in your church, but maybe in your family, in your business. And when you start talking about this boundary stuff, when you start talking about moving forward, they're not going to get it. And it's going to be unhealthy for you. It's actually going to challenge your ability to generate forward motion. When David starts acting like this, he gets up, he cleans himself up, and he starts moving forward. Some attendants come to him. In verse 18 and 21, we read this. So David's servants, they were afraid to tell him that the child is dead. You're going to have some people. They love you. They care about you. They do want what's best for you, but they will be afraid to help you define reality. They will not want to tell you the truth because it may hurt you where it may offend you or upset you. So his servants, his attendants asked him, why are you acting this way? While the child was alive, you fasted and wept, and now that the child is dead, you get up and eat. Why are you doing this? And you may have some people in your circle of influence who ask you that question. When you take this healthy approach and you map it out and you say, I am here, this is my reality, and I need to move forward, and it's gonna take some boundaries and that may stretch a relationship here or there. There may be some people who push back and say, why are you doing this? Why are you acting this way? But you move forward. Some of you are familiar with the concept of boundaries through Henry Cloud. He has written multiple books on the topic of boundaries, boundaries for families, leaders, children. Phenomenal author, phenomenal speaker. Anything you read of his is worth your time. But a consistent theme throughout these books, boundaries, that he makes in nearly every edition is this. You are going to get what you create or what you allow. Check in. 
you're trying to move forward. You're generating that motion, but you've got some people saying, why are you doing this? What are you creating? What are you allowing? Boundaries are often what an organization, a business, or even a family is waiting on, waiting on someone to step up and say, no more chaos, no more out of touch with reality mistakes. We define reality and then we move forward. And Michelle and I have experienced this a little bit in our relationship, our marriage, our family dynamic um, several years ago. So we decided to put together a family covenant. We looked at our family, we discussed what was really important to us as people, as parents, as spouses. We wrote those things down and we critiqued them into five F's, faith, family, finances, fitness, and fun. And then we elaborated on those. How do these values play out in the day-to-day life as we live green? And that's what we call it, the five F's to living green. And it has been such a catalyst for positive change in our lives. It set a direction. So what we did, we stepped it up a little bit um, a few months ago. We went to Saw Good, got one of the corner booths, a little spacious brought a PowerPoint. Um, I printed one out for everybody in the family. We all had our own family covenant. We're reading through it. We read read through every F and then at the end we sign it and we date it with the agreement as part of this family. I agree to live with you in this way. Boundaries. And that has proven to be such a useful tool to move us forward. When life happens and we have to redefine I am here reality, we get out our covenant. We review it so that we're not spinning or moving in reverse. We're moving forward, forward. One of my favorite men, he was a mentor. He was a retired ophthalmologist, smartest man I've ever met, brilliant guy, brilliant guy, never went to Bible college or anything like that, no formal training, but he knew so much about the Word of God. It was amazing. Uh, So smart that every Saturday for about a year, year and a half, I would go to his house Saturday morning at 8 o'clock till about 11 o'clock, and he would just teach me stuff about anything, anything from art to birds to geography, anything, brilliant guy. So I'll go to his office one day, And I'm standing there. And every time I went to his office, I would always look up at this one picture hanging on the wall. It was a rectangular frame and had a picture of this psychologist named Sigmund Freud. And I know some of you stir when you say that. I mean, can we use his name in church? But just hold on with me for a second. Sigmund Freud right there. And to the right of Sigmund's picture there was this quote that simply says, to be completely honest with oneself is the very best effort a human being can make. To be completely honest with oneself is the very best effort that a human being can make. That's defining reality. Being honest with yourself. So Monty referenced our connection cards. And I hope you filled that out especially if you're a first-time visitor. And on the back, there's a little section that says, my next step. But I'd like for us to define reality this morning, right here, right now. There may be some in here who have never decided to say, you know what, I need this guy Jesus as the leader of my life. I want to follow him. I've been following other people and it's just not working. It keeps me spinning or it sends me in reverse. So I want to follow this guy, Jesus. And if that's you, you have an opportunity to move from who knows into but now, right now, to change your life for eternity. Or maybe you are one of these guys who, you know, I'm a Christian and all that. I go to church and all that jazz. But you've just been, a, been on the fence about baptism. You've put it off for a variety of reasons. You want more family in town or you don't have a change of clothes with you this morning or something like that. 
Maybe that's your very next step. Would you check that box? Well, for some of you, it's joining Northeast Christian Church and becoming an owner. You've been going here for some time, but you've never made that next step to say, you know what? I want to be all in, all in. Some of you need to check the box to attend a next steps class. Some of this is new to you. What's this guy even talking about? Check that box. Some of you need to get connected with the community or learn, find out how to serve. We check the box that describes your I am here reality. And let's move this morning from who knows. You walked into this building thinking, ah, who knows about this? But now, right now, you can lock eyes with your life, define reality, and you can move forward. In the ancient world, the Greek culture, the term truth was synonymous with the term reality. So when Jesus comes on the scene and he says, hey, if you follow my teaching, then you're my disciples. And if I may, you will know the reality. And this reality will set you free. We are freed through the choices we make. And you have the choice right here, right now to move from who knows into but now and take your very next step. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit that moves us forward. Will you do just that at this moment? If you checked a box, there'll be some guys waiting for you right up front. You just come down, chat with them, can talk, fill this card out together, and we can move forward together. Now, if I would be a poor steward of our time if I didn't throw this in. When you look at the reality of our world, you look at what's going on in the news every single day, there's diversity and there's problems with race and religious background and political bend. And these are some of the things that separate and divide us. So what David does in this story is a beautiful, beautiful concept. He defines his reality. He crafts this intentional space for boundaries. He starts moving forward. And what happens next is just beautiful. And it echoes what God is doing in our world or wants to do in our world. He uses this forward motion that he's generating to build bridges. We forget about Bathsheba. We forget about her in the story. So much is focused on David. But after David embraces reality and starts moving forward, we read this in verse 24. The text simply says, David comforted his wife Bathsheba. So when he started moving forward, it increased his capacity to say, you know what, I'm going to build bridges into the lives of other people people. I can't bring my child back, but I can do this. That sets a precedent for the church in the first and 21st centuries. You and I, we start moving forward and then we start building bridges into the lives of other people. And what better place to start than with the diversity we're experiencing through race, religious background, and political bends. Rapid fire, I want to give you three verses from Romans that speak to this issue. Romans 14, 13 simply says, stop passing judgment on one another. Stop it. The word judgment means to separate. And you see on the news that our world is separating through politics, through someone's religious background, and through race. That's how we're separating one another. We don't do that in the church. The church is a refuge for the reality of a broken, broken world. On over in verse 19, we read, we must aim at those things 
that bring peace. And when you start generating this forward motion and building bridges, you aim at what brings us together and connects us. And then in 15.7, we read, accept one another just as Christ accepted you. No qualification. He accepts you in your reality, where you are this morning, right here, right now. You move from who knows into but now, defining reality. Let's pray. Father, help us to take that step. Whichever box we checked, whatever step that is, through the power and influence of your spirit, move us forward right now. In the name of Christ, amen.